Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. We have a very special show today. We're taping hours after the special session ended in Santa Fe, and we're honored to have our guest today, Senator Sue Ingle, Republican from Portales, the minority floor leader of the Senate, right. and Senator John Arthur Smith, Democrat, District 35, lives in Deming, the chair of Senate Finance. So we've got the minority floor leader of the Senate and the chair of Senate Finance, and I swear you two know where all the bodies are buried. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure for us to be here. Well, together you have 58 years in the Senate. You were first came up in 1985. That's 31 years. You came up in 89. That's 27 years. So, what will you tell our people what just happened in this special session? Well, uh, you know, the state of New Mexico over the past couple of years has had a tremendous downturn in revenue. We can say it's all from oil and gas. You know, and that's certainly a huge part of our uh, our money flow in the state of New Mexico, but it's not all of it. All the states in the Southwest and all lots of states in the United States have had some economic slowdowns, and we're certainly part of that. We uh, appropriate money over the years when there's money available and start lots of things, fund lots of things, but there's years, and this is the fourth or fifth time since this has happened in my years of, of, of being in the legislature, you have a real downturn in money, and you have to come back and make adjustments, and this past year, John's uh, finance committee did all the work they could to make sure that we had enough to get through, and they did the very best they could, but we we're still a little short in uh, from last year's budget, we came back to fix that and then hopefully fix a little bit of what's coming in the year we're in now, which ends June 30th. Lorraine, the financial situation in the state right now, uh, prior to this special session, we're worse off now than what happened in 2009. 2009, we had, uh, healthier, res had healthier reserves. We don't have any reserves right now, or, or didn't have. Uh, we had federal money flowing in. We had uh, non-reoccurring general fund money and capital outlay that we could claw back. We don't have any of that or not much of that. So this is a much more difficult financial situation we find ourselves in. And the other unknown fact is we don't know how long we're in for this downturn. So it's uh, been a real challenge. Uh, we started flagging the issue, quite frankly, uh, back in the prior session saying if we didn't get an uptick, we were going to be in special session. And we find ourselves today uh, uh, just finishing up a special session uh, on that. And, uh, but with knowing that far in advance, a lot of work went in to try and come up with a solvency package that would at least get us down the road. We we're hoping to have a, a little bump for 18. Uh, I'm not certain we got that, but we do believe we have uh, enough in there to get us on down the road a little bit further. Well, um it's really hard because it is bitter medicine to take. People do not want to talk about the budget. And so you, are you like Cassandra coming forth time and again saying, wake up, people. You know, you've got to pay attention to this because by law, tell me, one of you, why we cannot go into deficit spending. It's the law of the state of New Mexico for us to not have money to, that we spend without money there to make sure it's there. We can't go pass resolutions and go borrow money. We have to actually have money in these accounts and the government accounts to pay, pay the various things that we appropriate money for. And there's a point there where a treasurer will say, like they did back in 1988, say, as of this date, I will issue, not allow any ch checks to be issued in the state of New Mexico's name unless you give me a, a, a surge in the revenue and show me there's going to be this much more money coming in. I can't, I will not issue checks. That happened in 88 when oil went from $30 down to 4 and we had uh, we had a really har a hard time then. But we got through it, and the thing of it is, the beauty of it is, is this state always pays its bill with good money, and when we say we have it, and we have it in reserves, we truly have it. And Senator Smith has been really good at trying to make sure we have lots of reserves, and he's been that way through all kinds of governors. And sometimes, you know, he's been 
you know, a tough egg to crack because people want to spend more than we have, and he's, we have to make sure we have it. And that's, uh, but there's some years it doesn't really matter what you do. There's a fall in revenue, and that's all there is to it. And that's what we've been experiencing for the last couple of years. That's why they call him Doctor No, N O. But well, that's in right. my book, he's Doctor No K N O W because he knows how to work through all this. But your your hands are tied in some respect because revenue enhancements or tax increases in this current political environment and this administration are off the table. Lucky Varela sat here and he said, you know what I think about that? If you're going to keep milking this cow, you're going to have to feed it. So you managed to to plug these big holes because it added up to $600 million, $200 million from the last fiscal year, maybe 400 maybe more for this fiscal year. And you were able to do that without revenue enhancements? Uh, pretty much so. I mean, we have, we've closed some loopholes that are going to generate a few dollars for us, uh, but not a significant amount uh, from that standpoint. You know, when I first uh, started talking about special session, uh, I often heard the rhetoric, well, we don't want to support any cuts and we don't want to support any tax increases. <laughs> and, you know, you could either have to do a little bit of both or uh, go one direction on that. And what we attempted to do this time is try and have as much on the table as we possibly could. It's not fun to make the cuts. And Senator Engel uh, certainly knows that. And I need to put a plug in for Senator Engel and his leadership, uh, Senator Novell on Senate Finance, uh, and all the Republicans uh, there. We came up here recognizing the fact that we didn't want to be in a very polarized political arena. Uh, we were trying to do what is best for the state of New Mexico. We have serious, serious problems. And the smoothness of the Senate, uh, an awful lot of that credit has to go to the, the Senate Republicans. And I appreciate that. I appreciate my colleagues on the Democrat side of the aisle uh, on that. And when you start looking at the votes and the package we put together, uh, the average margin was 38 to 4 on mm. every package. Uh, we had about seven bills that were absolutely necessary to get through. And you have to do an awful lot of coordination and trying to get along beforehand uh, on that because we needed the emergency clause on, on this, and there's some debate on the requirement on the emergency clause. But obviously, without the cooperation of all members of the Senate, we wouldn't have had that emergency clause, but we did uh, on that. And, and that's why everything went very, very smooth in, in the New Mexico State Senate. Well, I want to compliment you, Senators, and the entire Senate for the maturity and the sophistication. And it was very clear to me that the, the best interests of our state in this difficult situation came first, not partisan politics. Now, do you think this could have been done in one day, had everyone honored what what do we need to do that's best for our state? Well, we darn near came that close to getting our package through in one day uh, on that. And uh, when I talk about the package, I'm talking about the financial crunch the, the state was in. Uh, but, but you have to have everybody on board. And I equate it to a school bond issue. You have some school districts where it fails, school bond issues, and they go to the voters just before the bond election. Uh, successful school bonds have to be cultivated all year long. And I would like to believe in the New Mexico State Senate that goodwill, and we respect each one another uh, on that, that we've tried to cultivate that on a year-round basis. Uh, and I think it was to the benefit of the state of New Mexico today with the uh, swiftness that the New Mexico State Senate moved. Well, they were passing bills back to us that basically we'd written, and so everybody knew what was in them. There's some, some amendments that had gone over in the caucuses. And basically, you know, we weren't going to raise any taxes to amount to anything. And the thing of it is, is, is lots of people think, well, the cows run out of milk. Well, sometimes the cow just has to eat less. <laughs> and the thing about it is, is we have to make sure, because when there's a downturn in the economy, people have, uh, have jobs problems. Sometimes they get a cut in pay if the, co the company's having trouble. 
you know, the state of New Mexico sometimes has to do things when it's not doesn't have enough money. You know, generating money is not always the way to solve problems for government. Sometimes we have to take a look at things and say we can take a little money back from here and not have to because our 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 revenues have to come from business and employment. And if you don't have business, you don't have employment. And state employment can't fund it all. We've got to have businesses that are successful and doing well and growing. And there's t periods of time in the economy in the United States when things slow down. We've got lots of things that have been passed in Washington that aren't helping us. But the thing about it is, we are directed by law to balance the budget, and that's what we do. And it doesn't matter which the governor is and where the governor is. And this governor has been very, uh, very tough on wanting to raise any revenues, and that's okay. Because for one thing, sometimes if we have too much revenue up here, we overspend, and then the cuts get even worse. So what we did this time in this session in the last couple of years is make some tough decisions and come back and make – we're going to have a lot more tough ones in January because uh, we just – we fixed enough to get us through and help us get through there. But 18 is going to be a tough year. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm dead wrong. Yeah. But, you know, maybe we will be, maybe we won't. But we're going to work together because it's not our job up here to see who can cause the most problems. It's our job to do the best job we can for the state of New Mexico on all issues. And to solve the problem. And to try to solve the problem and do our best because you can't ever pass something up here that always solves everything. You do the best you can and let time and things work and agencies work and government work to solve problems. And we are always going to be faced with that. And it doesn't really matter who is where and what is happening. We've got to do a good job for government and make sure we spend wisely. Doreen, the oil and gas industry, either directly or indirect, indirectly, I should the, say the extractive industry, uh, is responsible for about one-third of our entire general fund money for appropriation. And that amounts to a little over $2 billion typically. Uh, it has fallen to somewhere in the ballpark of about 800 to 900 million uh, on that because when I say indirectly, we're talking about gross receipts tax uh, and it uh, and corporate income tax and the oil and gas industry. We appreciate it, and we were down in our committee was down in Artesia, and the remarks were made by the industry saying New Mexico. Uh, you better start doing something a little bit different because the volatility of the extractive industry is aggravated even more with the Middle East uh, on it. But the numbers that they've gener generated for the state of New Mexico and have spread statewide, uh, we greatly appreciate it. But they're having a very difficult time. I think we've lost well over 6,000 jobs mm -hmm. in southeast and, mm -hmm. and northwest New Mexico. And we've got to find ways to broaden our base uh, revenue base and I think the administration has been right uh, making attempts to try to make us more competitive with other states but uh, we've got to do even more. Well we're speaking today with Senator John Arthur Smith a Democrat from Deming and with Senator Stu Engel Republican from Portales. We're filming the, the day the session ended just a few hours after it ended so I want to ask you one thing when you have to make these cuts you know, across the board, 5% for higher ed. And uh, I mean, you, it, it's like whose ox is getting gored? People want to take the cut somewhere else. I think we had some that, that people were really reluctant to make any cuts in uh, CYFD, Children, Youth, and Families Department, and, and public safety. But how, how do you determine where to cut and how much? Well, you just have to look at the various agencies that we have in government. And the think of it is you look at, at, at the amount of money that they often have and you say, we can take part of this and patch this in. And generally speaking, you talk to the agencies. How can you help here? And uh, there's agencies there. Well, I'll give you a good example. You know we have a concealed weapons carry program here in New Mexico. One of the sweep items there was a million dollars out of that fund from the concealed weapons carrier fund. They had $3 million in there. And, you know, it's there is some enforcement parts of that, but that's from the fees that are generated by these gun, the gun fees. We had some money from the environmental department. 
We had money from General Services Department. But these are all one-time shots. We don't, this is not something that just keeps going. We've taken what we can from most of those things and probably can't go back there again. But the thing about it is we have done that before and then we have to hopefully depend on our economy to get better. And I think it's going to. But the thing about it is when you have economy like we have sometimes with the oil industry, when there's such vast amounts of wages being paid and vast amounts of product being produced and it's selling at a great price and so few people realize that 82% of the royalty interest in the state of New Mexico are either federal or state. Most states don't have any kind of federal or, federal or state revenue of royalty interest. Mm -hmm. The state of Texas has maybe a half a percent that belongs to state or federal government. Oklahoma, three or four percent. Arizona has a quite a bit of, of uh, some things like that, and Colorado and Wyoming. But we are the a state that produces vast amounts of oil and gas from state-owned royalty interests. And that's why people don't sometimes understand how big a deal this is. The state of New Mexico totally owns those royalty interests under tremendous amounts of state land. And it's a great thing for us. And lateral drilling has completely opened up our oil fields that have been producing through the 30s and 40s and now it's brand new fields. Mm. You're not drilling one hole straight down, you're drilling down and in the laterally into that formation. And Lord knows that is a blessing for this state and its schools and children and everybody here. Maureen, uh, I think we ought to talk about some of the bumps in the road we had uh, yeah. with, with this. Uh, one of the huge issues that uh, was discussed uh, was school funding, public school funding. Uh, the public schools have $250 million of cash balances as we speak uh, on that. And some are uh, far in excess of, let's say, 5%, and many that have large cash balances can well justify some of that. But that is money, one-time money, that uh, is available for moving around and shifting. Uh, we invited and we had proposals on how much we should spend. It started out, I think, in the discussion about $120 million is what would be taken by the state to try and balance their budget. Uh, then it moved down to about 80 to $82 million, and we invited the school superintendents and their organization in to participate on how we could do this and still make certain they're viable. The, public, the superintendents said, hey, we will step to the plate. The problem was we locked in uh, the proposal we had. Senator Engel was told, and I was told, we can live with about 80 to $82 million like that, right. uh, on that. And so we ran with that. Well, I ran into problems within my caucus, and you probably ran into a few bumps in your Certainly caucus did. on that. But in the meantime, the uh, uh, superintendents uh, sort of got on a different sheet of music. And so it makes it very difficult when you think you have a meeting of the minds, Senator Ingalls in mind, and based on input from the professionals, so to speak, and then the next day, once you've moved ahead and told your caucus that this is the way we're going, uh, with their input, the, the uh, school said, no, nah, we've shifted directions <laughs> now. And it makes it a little tough, and, and I think that's a tough one for both of us to swallow because we're out on a limb and we have caucus members saying, well, why'd you change, or you should have done it sooner, that sort of thing. But those were the bumps in the road. We got over that this time. There's another bump in the road I want to talk about, all the law and order issues that came up in the House. Three nights in a row, well, not in a row, but three nights during the six-day special session, the issue of reinstating the death penalty was argued in the middle of the night without any public input, Last night, the night before the session ended, they went until 6 o'clock in the morning. I listened to every single word arguing against and for the reinstatement of the death penalty. It just seems to me like it's a way, well, it looked a little, I'm kind of cynical, it looked, like, it looked political because, and it may be part that people just don't want to look at the, the difficulties of the budget, but it was long and passionately argued. And... Um, Talk to me about why why so much time was spent. I know it's the other house, 
Um, well, there were three issues there. There was a, a law and order bill about the, the uh, killing of that young young woman there and the child abuse sort of thing, Brianna's Law. Yeah. And there was a three strikes you're out law right. and then the uh, death penalty law. Right. So there's three laws, three things there. The one, uh, the, the death penalty was heard in, in the committee, I think, finance committees where the only, and it was heard I think one night for several hours there were some there was witnesses there it was voted out of there once the bill gets to the floor and uh, you know I don't know uh, I don't know their procedure over there but I do know they had witnesses in in the committee meeting but the thing about it is it took three or four hours on that bill and it took two or three hours on each one of the other ones the thing about it is those were introduced in the house Two of those bills, in my opinion, should have passed. The wanted, or not wanted, dead or alive, the, the, <laughs> the death penalty bill was controversial. We all knew that. But there was surveys done, and we all know about the young, poor young girl in Albuquerque. These things are often spawned by that, and it doesn't really matter. Uh, I, I would say that uh, almost any governor in that s situation would have probably included that in a, in a session. And, and some some other penalty things too. The things that I wish we could have voted on there was a couple of those other bills. The one the the death penalty bill, obviously was going to create a tremendous amount of stuff. But the thing about it is, it was an issue that the people, you know, you saw the polling just as I did. Seventy percent of the people wanted to take a look at it. But the polling didn't inform those people that even if we reinstated well, the death penalty, well, it does not apply to that. Were, we know that. Yeah. We all know that. We don't have to have those polling things say that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those are just gut issues that happen in politics. They always do. But the thing about it is, it's just one of those things that happens. And Lord knows, I was here when Bill Richardson did his share of that stuff, and uh, it was all over the place the same way. But that's just part of the part of the what happens here. And I don't I don't think it's uh, anything that was out of line at all. It was debated, talked about. It passed one house. It didn't pass the other. But the thing about it is, it's okay to to look at other things too in a special session. And. Certainly, it'll come back in the 60-day, well, these issues. That, that, that yeah. was my concern. Yeah. And Senator Engel, this is an issue that we probably disagree on, and we're still going to be friends when it's all over with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But my, my concern was, my focus was on, on the budget, uh, the most critical thing. I didn't want to have to be in a position where we're going to have to furlough law enforcement, correction officers, educators uh, on that. That was my primary mm -hmm. focus. Now, if we were nine months away from a recession, it would be one thing. But we're three months out. We're three months out. And I said early on, we'll be more than happy to address that in the next 60-day session. The most critical thing that we did right now, we don't want the state writing hot checks. And, and I think we took care of the, the business first on that particular issue, uh, on that. And we've got plenty of time. Any law that we passed on the death penalty when that was the big focus, I think, coming out of Albuquerque, that would not have become law until right at January right. Uh, on that because there wasn't the emergency clause on it uh, from that standpoint. And it's not that it's not critically important. We've got people in our own caucus that I'm sure will probably support that. But the bottom line is we're about 90 days away from the regular session to handle that and that issue will surface again thank you let's look at quickly we only have two minutes left but so obviously our dependency on oil and gas we need to perhaps broaden our our our, our ways of getting money for the state what are some ways that you think and there's an a, an idea that i've loved for years which is the tax expenditure budget where you look at all the exemptions we're giving, I think they add up to $5 billion. Is there ever going to be uh, the leadership to sit down and say, let's look at all of these, go from zero base and put in the ones that still give us return on investment? But there's some like buggy whip manufacturing, and I just made that up. But there's some that are no longer appropriate to us, and yet we still give them these tax breaks. Do you think that it's, we're ever going to be able to look at everything we give away and pull it in a little? Maureen, when I got started in the legislature, my hope was that we would have complete tax reform. Yeah. Uh, as we move forward, I'm saying you, we're going to have to do it in piecemeal. There are so many special interest groups out there protecting their hide that it's extremely difficult to move in one 
uh, big tax package. We've tried that. Um, Bill Richardson had the Blue Ribbon Tax Committee, and we could not get the complete reform we have. I do believe that we can come up with a responsible plan if we keep in mind the old saying that we want broad base and low rates, and we need to be moving in that direction. Well, the thing about our tax system here, and when I was first uh, elected to the legislature, there was a gentleman here named Franklin Jones that basically wrote tremendous amounts of the tax law in New Mexico, and I used to visit with him a couple of hours a week. And he told me, he said, Stuart, the one thing you don't want to ever do here is repeal any of our gross receipts tax systems. He said, our economy in so many of our counties is not very liquid. And he said, we have tremendous amounts of people coming in this state. And he said, when we need to give money back from our gross receipts tax system, we can rebate it back to our taxpayers. He said, if you start repealing this, you will never stop repealing it. And this is exactly what's happened over the years when our oil monies went through the roof. We begin to take monies away. And as, as Senator Smith said, you know, we've got to look at some things now. And we have the hold harmless thing that happened to our cities. And now we're going to try to have to take all this back. Because for one thing, our revenue for our cities and counties, oil stayed at $120 a barrel. We wouldn't be talking about this. But it's not gonna, it didn't do that, and it's not going to. We're going to have to take a hard look at some of those things, and we're going to have to put gross receipts tax back and let our cities sometimes do some of those things so that they can have money. Because that bill was never defined like it should, should have been on food products. Yeah. I mean, Coca-Cola, candy. it was corn tortillas or flour yeah, tortillas. You know, and those things, those things really should have been defined heavily and it wouldn't have cost us the $140 million a year it's costing us. It should have cost between 35 and 40 But nobody wanted to say no. Yeah. And the thing of it is, it's hard to say no, but if you don't, it gets you in trouble. And we, had to, we didn't do it, so now we're going to have to change some things. Well, we've got 30 seconds left, John. What do you say? Well, we appreciate this opportunity to uh, share with the state uh, the, uh, uh, what happened in the special legislative session. And I want to say thank you, a big thank you, to all my colleagues in the New Mexico State Senate because it ran smooth. Well, the Senate um, is supposed to do things for the people of the state of New Mexico. And we can disagree, and the thing about it is we got to think of the folks that sent us here and all the people in New Mexico, because we're not here for our own advancement. We're here to keep this state solid, safe, and going strong. Well, on behalf of the people of New Mexico, I want to thank you for your 58 years of service to the state, and I'm honored to have you join me today. Our guests are Senator Stu Engel, Minority Leader of the New Mexico Senate. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Senator John Arthur Smith, Head of Senate Finance, Democrat from Deming. Thank you so much for coming and, and, and telling us what really happened thank in special you. session. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.